wolves are just kind of one of those things that now, I mean, we they're part of the gig. We have to deal with it, but they definitely make it to where they take some of the joy out of hound hunting because you're always just, you've always got that feeling in your gut that you're just like, I don't know if I'm going to see these dogs again alive, you know? Because, I mean, you could turn them loose and you get there and the wolves beat you there, but it's one of those things that during cat season, we do our best to control for it because we can kind of keep track of tracks and paying attention to where they're at. But during bear season, it's always a gamble unless you've ran in that area before. My voice is a uh, my voice is a little rough from UFC 300. I kind of scream my face off it at a couple of the fighters, especially Jim Miller. <laughs> um, it's hard when you're watching your friend get his face smashed i just kept screaming at him yeah <laughs> move his damn head <laughs> so uh thanks for coming out uh a little bit short notice but i've wanted to get you on here um uh for a while but i think it's especially good now with kind of what you got going but how uh it, it's it's kind of wild because like i've actually known you since you were a little kid which mm-hmm. is kind of wild or pretty little anyway how old are you i am 25 25 so yeah not not like a little kid but definitely like junior high high school yeah with all the 4-H stuff yeah um which is wild because remember when you were like the old kid in 4-H and my girls were like the little girls and now they're the old girls and Mm -hmm. it's crazy how that all comes so fast yeah uh what the hell happened to your brother how did he get to be such a giant and like because you're not big uh your folks aren't big I, you know, I think on Has my your mom told you who his dad is yet? <laughs> the mailman? <laughs> yeah. Or the milkman, I guess. He's a monster. He is. He's a beast. He's yeah. impressive. Uh, so you grew up uh, here in Frenchtown, whole mm-hmm. life born and raised here? Yep. Yep. We've been much. here my entire life. I've yeah. always went to Frenchtown. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's unique seeing... Um, and I would say it's it's not as unique necessarily anymore. Like, there's definitely a lot more women getting into the hunting space uh, in the last 10 years than, sure. than, than, you know, 25, 30 years ago, 40 For years sure. ago. But I think you're definitely more unique than most of the women that do this in the fact that, like, how involved in it you are and also in the way you do it. I mean, how much you run uh, mountain lions with hounds and bears with hounds and, and really by yourself mm-hmm. um, and with other people. But... Uh, I've always found it really cool. Like I'd be talking to your dad and of course your dad loves to brag about you all the time. Yep. He's terrible about that. <laughs> um, no, nah, he's, he's awesome. But, uh, what, when did you start running like cats or, I mean, we really couldn't run bears in Montana. Uh, we could over in Idaho, but like, when did you start running, um, you know, animals with dogs? Was it as a little girl? Um, so my dad's got pictures of me when I was like a toddler that he had me out a couple times. Like the first experience I really remember where I really first got like hardcore into it is the first lion I ever killed. We ended up on a crazy chase and I was seventh grade, I think. And it was like an eight mile hike and terrible, terrible snow. And we got out, it was like 1 a.m. and it was just like oh my gosh that was the most hardcore crazy thing ever but at the same time it was just so rewarding at the end of it and after that I mean I was pretty much hooked and I started hunting with him a lot more and then as soon as he started to kind of get out of it and I got to about a senior in high school I started hunting a lot more by myself and kind of started raising and training my own dogs and I've just been crazy about it ever since so yeah what uh what's that uh you know, with, with raising that many hounds, like how many hounds, you know, at a time do you guys have? So I have 11 right now. I've got one that I'm training for someone else that he's just kind of paying me to keep her and run her. And then I've got another one that I'm selling. So I'll be down to nine here shortly. My boyfriend, Aaron has 10. He just got two more puppies. So we're going to be at 20 oh. dogs. Oh basically. my gosh. Yeah. It's, it's kind of chaos right now. What is there. a, uh, what's a feed bill? Um, for and me, it's like around 500 bucks a month. Really? So for us combined, it's going to be a little more than that. Yeah, no doubt. But, um, do your neighbors hate you? We're pretty much in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so I've never had any complaints. I know where he's at. He, he gets more complaints gets than we complaints, do. Yeah, yeah. So he's got to keep his a little more under wraps than I do with mine. Uh, I had never actually hunted myself over hounds. I've always had friends that have hounds. And when I, when I went to Canada last year, uh, 
bear hunting uh, in northern BC, <clears throat> that guy had hounds. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really, initially I wanted to do a spot and stock, mm-hmm. but then we uh, we took the hounds out and we did a, a, a chase and we did it where we, they didn't want to just release on like the first time that a hound struck on like a, on a scent because you don't know what you're releasing on. It yep. could be a small bear and could waste the whole entire day. Mm-hmm. So he really wanted to v- get a visual and we did, we ended up, we were up in this logging road in the middle of freaking nowhere and this bear jumped out, took off running and, and with it running away, you could definitely tell it was like, it was worth chasing. It's still hard to tell exactly, but it meant it looked like a big bear. Mm-hmm. Um, and to get to watch those dogs, uh, chase that bear. Um, it was, I, I learned a lot. Like one, it was absolutely incredible to watch, uh, watch them work together and, 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 and how they did that. And then, you know, we kind of dropped down and around we hiked in and this bear was up a tree. What I didn't realize with bears and explain this a little bit more, but like mountain lions tend, if I'm right, they tend to tree a little quicker and go up a tree where a, where a bear will literally just kind of walk along Mm-hmm. And the dogs will be all around it barking at it, and that bear won't even really give a shit about it. Yep. Because yep. I think a lot of people think that these bears are, there's a lot of controversy around like, oh, you're harassing them or you're hurting them, mm-hmm. uh, or even with the mountain lions and stuff. But I was actually amazed at how calm those bears were. Like, it, it just wasn't really a big deal. And like that that guy said, it, it can actually be a real pain in the ass because that bear can just walk. Yep. He, he can ignore the dogs and walk and now you have to go get your dogs and and they can cover some ground oh yeah yeah so the bears i mean the bears and lions are used to it if you think about it we've got wolves everywhere anymore and those wolves will do the same thing they'll run lions and bears off of their kills and they'll they'll actually kill bears if they can and lions but for the most part like the lions they get ran off their kills all the time so those lions are used to climbing in a tree and sitting and waiting for them to be done and leave them alone and that's what we do i mean for the most part, we don't harvest a bunch of lions or anything. We just get them in a tree, take pictures, tell the dogs good job, and then pull them off and leave. And the lions do, like you were saying, they'll sometimes you'll have a lion that'll give the dogs a little bit of a run. But for the most part, they're kind of like a quarter horse versus a thoroughbred is how my dad always like kind of compared it is those bears, they got a lot more stamina. So if they decide to run from the dogs, they'll run and run and run and run and run. And eventually, sometimes they'll get tired out and they'll finally decide to climb a tree or something will happen to where you kind of get them cut off or something, you know, just kind of changes their mind. But those cats, they'll like max, I think usually is like 100, 200 yards where they'll actually run from the dog once the dogs are jumped. Really? So it's like... they just go up a tree. Yeah, they don't, they don't typically run much. Um, so most of like a lion race is going to be just that cold trail. Dogs are just following that scent where that like cat had walked. Um, And then a bear race is almost always going to be mostly the dogs have it jumped and they're actually following that bear and pursuing that bear that whole time. Yeah. Um, We've got, sometimes you'll have them, like you're saying, they'll walk with the dogs and they'll just kind of, they don't care so much. They're just like, whatever, like, I'm just going to keep walking. I'm going to keep doing my thing and you'll have dogs. And the biggest thing for us that we found is having a dog that'll kind of get in front of that bear and more or less get in its face. And that, that kind of will persuade that bear to be like, okay, I do have to kind of care that you guys are here and I have to make a decision on whether or not I'm going to sit or try to keep running from you or if I'm going to climb a tree. And if you have dogs that just kind of follow that bear, they'll, those bears just don't care. Those bigger bears are nasty and I'll just kind of whatever, like we'll just keep going and we're going to go all the way over this mountain and over to the reservation or wherever I feel like, you know? Yeah. I You, you hit on one thing about, actually harvesting these animals that's the other thing i think when people see you know uh, a houndsman or houndswoman up in the mountains uh they just assume that like anything that they're treeing they're killing yep and it's it's funny because i i think i know more hounds houndsmen that that don't kill anything like literally anything for frankly for years yep uh it's literally just a, a sport um with their dogs like they just like to go watch their dogs work yep. and you know some of these people that run how or run run bears and lions feel like if they kill them then it's just gonna be less for them to run so they just like to run them exactly and then it's it feels like most people will will just run stuff until they really do get a true huge huge cat in a tree or mm-hmm. something like that where they'll decide to harvest one but at that point that cat's probably pretty old yep um and 
you know, probably doesn't have a heck of a lot of time left at that point in his life when he's that size. But is that, is that, is that true? Is that what you found or? Yeah, I think most of the truly hardcore houndsmen that you're going to find care way more about the dogs and way more about having cats in the woods to go run and dead cats don't leave tracks. Right. So, I mean, our biggest thing is if we do catch a mature Tom and we have someone there that really wants to shoot it or one of us wants to harvest it, then we're going to go ahead and harvest that cat, but we don't harvest females. We don't harvest small toms. I mean, we try to keep it pretty limited on what we're taking. Bears is a little, little more liberal on that just because we have so many bears, but I think um, for this year, it'll be interesting because we're actually starting that outfit down in Idaho. So we're going to be harvesting a few more bears than we normally would, but I guess we'll see kind of how that goes as far as size wise goes and stuff. But for the lions, for sure, we're very, very picky and we try to keep it to big, mature toms. And I mean, I've killed two lions now and I've been running since I was 14. And when I was 14 was the first one that I shot. So I, I have no interest in probably ever killing a lion again because I just don't need to. I mean, I've got one life size and I'll have another one life size. And what do yeah. you do with them after that? So yeah, become the crazy cat lady. <laughs> exactly. So walk people through how... What, what does the day look like? Uh, okay, hey, we're going to go cat hunting. And it's December or January or whatever. We, we're going to go cat hunting. Uh, walk us through the day from literally once you get out of bed, what's it look like to go cat hunting with dogs? So depending on when the snow comes, I mean, if we have good snow and say it snowed the night before. Say and it, it snowed at 10 o'clock last night. It snowed four inches. Okay, so we're probably going to get up around midnight and start hitting every single road we can because a lot of the area we run has high pressure. So we're trying to beat people to the tracks. Um, if I are run you getting her up, are you feeding dogs before you go or are you uh, just loading them in boxes? What, what's, what's it look like at the house? So typically I'll honestly leave my dogs at home and let them sleep rather than harassing them and waking them up and getting them up to go jostle around in the dog box. Um, the dogs, so the hounds for cat season, we typically only feed them once a day. That's supposedly the healthiest. They're only supposed to be fed once a day unless they're running real hard. In cat season, it's like they don't they don't get nearly as much exercise during cat season. Oh, really? But it's cats are just easier to catch. So unless you're running three, four cats a day, I mean, they're not really running that hard. Mm-hmm. Unless I mean, the deeper snow can kind of push them, but it's still it's nothing compared to running bears. Mm-hmm. Um. So, yeah, we get up pretty early. It just kind of depends on the snow level and what area we're running. Some areas have way more pressure. My favorite area, there's hardly ever any houndsmen in, so I can get up at 5 or 6 and still know that I'm going to probably be able to cut a track and not worry about someone beating me to it. But we'll go drive typically, I mean, until we find a track. So we'll just drive roads, drive roads, drive roads, and you run out of roads in one area, you move to the next area and keep driving roads. Um, We'll... Usually there's a couple people running roads, so usually by daylight we want to have a track, and once we get a track, we'll run back to the house and grab dogs and load them up and figure out who we're taking, grab all of our Garmin stuff and make sure we got backpacks, you know, whatever. If it's in an area where we think we're going to need better access, we'll take snowmobiles, load up snowmobiles, um, and then we'll show up to that track and kind of everybody discusses what we want to do, or if it's just me, I'm like, well... If it's a fresh track, I'll usually try to let some younger dogs out on it and let them try to get it sorted out and kind of learn just from association on that track and not having the biggest thing with lions is you can only have so many dogs because that lion scent gets diminished quickly when you got dogs going over the top of it. Oh. So if you can get one or two puppies out front, they get a lot more of that scent to kind of learn, oh, hey, this is what we're chasing. We're not just following dogs around, you know, and then you put one big dog behind them to be like, okay, here's your your puppy trainer for the day and you got to figure out what's going on if they screw it up but typically then they tree that cat wherever they're going to tree that cat and we got to figure out how to get in there and sometimes you know they're 50 yards off the road and you're like woohoo this is awesome and sometimes they're two miles deep and you're like well this is going to be a long day but so usually we'll get one treed and then sometimes we'll have more than one track already sometimes we'll go run more road and see if we can find another track and sometimes we call it a day but I what do you how how do you uh if if you just let your dogs out in the middle of nowhere on a track how are you keeping track of your dogs uh, uh, and what's that look like so the Garmin systems we run are 
pretty high tech. They're super fancy compared to what they used to have back in the day. So it'll show us exactly where the dogs are, if the dogs are running, if they're sitting, if they're treeing. It'll tell us how many barks per minute they're doing so we can kind of figure out, hey, they've got to jump, they're losing their minds, or, oh, they're still cold trailing, they're barely barking and moving slow, kind of doing little zags, trying to pick at that track. Um, the only, like, kind of downfall about those systems is sometimes, like, in the country we run, it's really steep. So if they go up and over a ridge... A lot of times you'll lose communication with them. So you either got to try to get over that ridge or get around and go to the other side so you can get comms with them. But I mean, they're compared to what like my dad used to run with and stuff. I mean, we're pretty fortunate. We get a pretty good picture of what exactly is going on and where exactly those dogs are. I, I remember when I was younger, some of the houndsmen around Lincoln where I grew up would stop by the house and be like, hey, a couple of days ago, I lost a couple of dogs like in this area keep mm-hmm. your eye out. I mean, it was pretty common for guys to look for dogs for yep. a week Yep, and they'd end up showing up somewhere usually. Yep. Um, it really wasn't really a problem with wolves back then, but mm-hmm. it was more of just a problem of, you know, collars and keeping yep. track of them. Yeah. You don't, if you don't have a collar on them, I mean, sure. Sometimes you got snow and you can follow their tracks in the snow until you can't follow them no more, but you have no way of recalling them. You have no way of saying, Oh, Hey, You know, they went three miles up this drainage and then turned around and came right back down and treed five yards off the road, you know? So it's like you could be hiking and hiking and hiking and eventually, you know, you just end up somewhere crazy, but. How how good are those uh, cats at tricking the dogs? I mean, how many get away? You know, as far as like cats go, I haven't had many that have managed to trick dogs. Sometimes you'll get a cat that'll kind of try to like go up and run its backtrack and then bobcats really like to run loops and stuff we actually had a pretty interesting race this year with a kind of crazy female that was running like a bobcat she was hopping over logs and like running downfall and stuff and then she came up and went down her backtrack a couple times and um my boyfriend Aaron was hiking behind the dogs because it was kind of a sketchy area so it's like usually if there's two of us someone will go hike behind the dogs and try to stay close to them just for the fact of wolves um And he actually, he had the dogs up ahead of him up this like draw, maybe 500 yards or so. And they were running up this draw and he looks up, he hears a noise and here comes this cat straight back down its backtrack right at him. And he sees it and he just like starts waving his arms, like trying to get it to run up a tree and it ran the other way. But anyways, he got the dogs like back down there and they ended up treeing it. But for the most part, you know, unless I've got like just an absolute puppy mess, the cats usually can't outsmart the hounds. Um, the bears, I wouldn't even say the bears outsmart the hounds. They'll just outrun the hounds on occasion if they're just going into an absolute, um, terrible nasty, downfall. Yeah. Whereas like, and a lot of times it's not even that they're outrunning the dogs. It's that they're headed to an area that we're a little worried about with wolves and we have to pull the dogs off. So once, once those you've released those dogs, I mean, how are you, how do you pull a dog off? I mean, they're out of your, they're a quarter mile away from you, half mile away from you. Mm -hmm. uh barking and running and whatever like how's that work so the garmin systems also have a training system so all of our puppies we kind of train to associate we call it a tone so it'll just beep them it'll make a beeping noise and we train them that when they hear that noise they need to come find us so basically i mean like we kind of train them by you know they hear that noise they don't listen we shock them so then they hear that noise and they associate it with being shocked um So most I was gonna say because if you had a puppy on a track, you wouldn't mm-hmm. want to really shock them necessarily yeah. to make them like no. not want to go the next time. Like mm-hmm. they smell that smell, like well, I don't want to go chase that. I'm gonna get shocked. Yeah. So usually the way we kind of get puppies trained is we'll take them out a lot and they'll get the opportunity to go chase deer and some trash. So we'll do some trash breaking and some tone training at the same time. So they'll learn that hey, that tone means I need to turn around and get my butt back. So what that means is you're actually putting them kind of on a deer track on purpose, but then mm-hmm. you're shocking them. Yeah. So we'll kind of because you don't them want that. them just for people that are listening to this. Like you don't want them chasing deer and elk and. Yep. All the off game, as we call it, or trash. Yeah. So anything that's not a bear, lion, or bobcat, they are not allowed to chase. So they'll kind of learn that through. We'll take them out roading, take them out hiking, all that stuff. Just kind of getting them exposure to all those scents that we want them to not be pursuing with a couple big dogs. So we kind of know what's going on. But yeah, so they'll hear that tone and depending on how far away they are, sometimes they're with an earshot and we can holler at them and they'll come straight to us. And other times if they're not an earshot, they'll just 
take their backtrack and they'll follow themselves all the way back out to where we turn loose. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. They're pretty smart. Yeah, that is smart. the 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 being wise thing is 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 amazing because I got I got to witness it in Canada. But like with puppies, um, how how do you how old can, can they be before you first put them on a track? Um, honestly, as soon as they want to go, I let them go. I'll try to get like anywhere from four to five months. I start trying to take them out with me. So they get exposure to the big dogs. We'll hike them into trees. I'll, if I got a Garmin collar that I can fit around their neck, that'll stay on. I'll let them go out. And if they want to chase the big dogs and try to go, I'll let them go. Like it's the biggest thing is sometimes you end up having to hike in and get them. And it is what they get it tired is, and just sit down and give up. Yeah. Or they'll get way behind and they're like, I don't know where everybody went. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to sit here and you go get them. But they, that's the best way I've found for them to kind of get that exposure early to where you get some faster starting dogs that way. I know there's some guys that don't like to start dogs until they're a year old or whatever age. And I mean, everybody does it differently. It's, there's a tons of different ways to do it. And I suppose it might be easier to not have to worry about hiking in after little tiny puppies, but I enjoy doing it. And I think that that way, a lot of times you'll get them going to where they're actually making races and knowing what's going on from six to eight months old. Yeah. Interesting. How often do, uh, I'm kind of asking you all about cats right now. How often do the cats turn on the dogs and like, how often do you have like dog injuries from cats? You know, I have had, oh man, one, one incident where I've had a dog actually get hurt from a cat and that cat decided he picked a really nasty tree that was just like tiny little fir tree and he was waving around on top of it and you could tell he did not like it and he decided to come out of that tree and we weren't prepared for that. I wasn't even there. One of my buddies was there and he had a couple dogs there was it and he, that cat tripped up when he was coming out and he kind of fell and one of my lead dogs was ready for that and he pile drove that cat and I mean that cat like opened him up a little bit, nothing terrible, but the other dogs kind of ran into the mix and managed to break them all free and the cat ran off and picked another tree. But I have never had an experience with a cat deciding not to tree. Mm-hmm. Um We've had them pick like leaning trees where the dogs will try to go up and get smacked on a little bit or anything like that. But I've personally never had an experience where a cat has decided to sit on the ground and turn around and try to get dogs. I know there's a couple guys over in Bozeman that have had an issue with that. And then there's, I mean, I think there's guys everywhere that occasionally have an issue. It's just not very common. And in our area, I've just never seen it personally. Right. Interesting. Yeah. It's, uh, it's wild to see those dogs, um, like literally climb these trees. I mean, oh, some yeah. of these dogs will uh, chew at the bark on the bottom of the tree, they rip off branches. I mean, yep. the the drive for those dogs, uh, and, and that's the thing. I mean, it, it doesn't matter what animal it is, the instincts that they have, whether it's a bird dog. Mm-hmm. You know, you uh, last fall I watched my Labrador as, as a pretty young dog on her first bird hunt um, just work herself to death. Oh, yeah. You know, going after birds mm-hmm. um, to where I, I had to call it at the end. I was like, hey, she's she's going to be hurting, yep. you know, she, yep. but that that instinctual drive is absolutely crazy, crazy to watch. It is. It is. It's really it's cool to just be able to. I mean, personally, for like us, we don't do that much training ourselves. I mean, for the most part, those dogs are training themselves and the big dogs, like the older dogs, the lead dogs are training those puppies for us. I mean, we, we do minimal work to where we're kind of doing some trash breaking and that's about it. And then the rest is just those dogs instincts, just being like, Hey, I want to go hunt. And once you tell me what I'm allowed to hunt, then I'm going to hunt it. Right. You know, it's interesting. There's obviously a lot of people that don't understand and don't like the hound hunting and whatnot. Um, but there's another facet of this that I got to experience in Canada, uh, I shot a bear with my bow and uh, didn't make a great shot, hit a little far forward, kind of front of the shoulder. Um, Didn't really know it at the time because we had a heck of a blood trail originally. Thought it was going to be good to go. And then, uh, you know, tracking this bear. And then pretty soon the thing's heading uphill, which is a bad sign. And then the blood starts drying up and now it's a drop here and there. And we got back to this logging road and it was almost dark and uh you know the 
the guide was like, well, we could maybe bring the dogs back in the morning. And, you know, I felt bad and I really wanted to find this bear, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, we go back to camp. So that's probably, you know, seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night, go back to camp. So that scent sits all night long. Uh, we woke up and it was actually a little bit rainy at our cabin, but we were probably 30 miles from where that, that bear was. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like it was a pouring rain everywhere. So we we're like, you know, and the guide's like, I don't really know, like probably won't be able to pick up the scent. And I'm like, well, I want to try. Yeah. So we loaded up a bunch of dogs. Uh, we hadn't used dogs. I mean, that was spot and stock. Took the dogs up there and he had this old, old hound that had cancer. Um, big, big mass hanging off of his back end. And he had said, well, this is, this is going to be his last season. Yeah. Um, but he took out a kind of young dog. I wouldn't call it a trainer dog, but like pr pretty young took that dog out and took that old dog out mm -hmm. and, you know, put them on that scent and you could see him pick it up, yep. but they didn't just go blazing off. Like they, they followed it and that young dog was gone for probably five minutes uh -huh. and came back. And then we got that young dog kind of back on it center again. And every now and then you could hear that old dog up in the, in the timber every now and then you just hear Burr! and then nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. And he was same thing, watching his collars. Yep. Dog was moving slow. And every now and then he'd let out a little, little howl mm -hmm. and, uh, or bark. And I mean, this went on for at least 30 minutes and he's like, yeah, I don't think it's going to work. But that old dog was continuing to move yep. real slow, just continuing to move. And it's 30, 40 minutes later, all of a sudden that dog just loses his shit. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the guy was like, eh, he probably cut a different bear's track. Cause especially up there in Canada, they have mm -hmm. so many bears. It's unbelievable. I mean, you're oh, driving yeah. the roads and it's, you're like, when you see deer in the field down here, you see bears in fields <laughs> grazing. It's wild. And he's like, I don't know. And so, you know, that dog loses shit. And then the young dog hears it catches up. Yep. And so he's like, well, we'll see. So he turned a, a couple more dogs loose. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they head up the mountain they join up and uh, they're chasing this bear and this bear's heading up towards these cliffs. And then all of a sudden it starts coming down and it, this bear comes down the hill, like hauling ass coming down this hill. The yep. dogs are following. So we run up to this logging road and park. And right when we get to where we're going to intersect him, he didn't want to run the dogs over. Yep. I mean, right when we got there, uh, we had missed the bear, but the dogs come bailing off the hill and over into the bottom. And so he let two more dogs go into that bottom and, uh, they run a big circle and that bear's coming straight back towards where we're standing. And I think that bear might've heard or smelled us or whatever. And he got to within less than a hundred yards and went up a tree, mm -hmm. walked down there and it was my bear. And it was probably, I'd say almost 10 more minutes the old dog showed up yep, because he couldn't keep up with the, oh, young, yeah, with no, the young dogs. Mm -hmm. But it was unbelievable that that, that old dog, he, he was patient. He, yep. he just stayed with it. He, you could tell several times he had lost it because yep. he'd start wandering around back and forth and whatnot. And he'd make a it. big circle yep. and then he'd pick it up. And you mm -hmm. later on, you look at the track, it all made sense, mm -hmm. but you could see these areas that he had, would make losses. Yeah, would, would lose go, it and yeah, find it to pick it back yeah, up. Yeah, and that bear probably slept there all night mm -hmm. where he found it. Oh yeah, kicked Jumped it, it out of its bed. Yep. Um, but I was blown away to see how that that old old dog was so so wise. Yep. You know, do do you guys have similar experiences with your old dogs compared to your young ones? And yeah, so I mean, the oldest dog I have right now is four and a half. So okay, I so don't, not real old. We've got a. We both got pretty young packs. He's got one, I think, that's about the same age. That's around four and a half as his oldest dog, too. But so my oldest dog is kind of, you know, he's he's not that old. But I think once they hit a certain age, they kind of start to mature and, like, they slow down and they use their brain a little more. They don't have that, like, crazy puppy excitement over everything. Um, but my oldest, like, lead dog, Crash, he's he does kind of the same thing. We actually caught a bear last night off of a rig and the dogs blew up like it was a super hot rig and the wind was kind of swirling so we let them down and I mean 
they screwed around for a while. It was like, okay, I don't know what, what we just rigged. And then he finally decided to go up and he kind of made this loop out like in a totally different direction than the wind than the wind was blowing. And I was like, okay, well that doesn't make a ton of sense. But then all of a sudden I'm kind of watching him on this hillside and he just puts his nose to the ground and his tail just starts wagging like crazy. And I'm like, Oh, he's about to bark. He's got some sort of cold scent he likes. And sure, sure enough, he starts kind of sounding off a little bit and just like walking this track. And I'm like, I don't know how we rigged that. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like they rigged, like it was, there was a bear right on the hillside. Right. And they, Aaron gets a couple more dogs up there and he's got his older dog up there. And then one of his younger dogs, that's going to be a really nice dog. And they're kind of going, going, going. And then all of a sudden his younger dog kind of picks her head up and kind of jets down, down off the other side of this little ridge that we've got. And he's like, what are you, what is she doing? Like he, he went, he almost went to call her back and she kind of ignored him. And all of a sudden she just blows up. And this bear was just on the other side of this little finger ridge. And like the best we could figure out was that we had a strong draft of wind that just pulled that bear scent up and over that hill and they lost it after that because the wind was kind of swirling yeah and i mean the reason we i mean i think if we would have drove a little further we might have rigged it again not positive but probably but like that older dog just was like patient enough he's like okay i'm gonna go find some sort of set and i'm gonna work it even if it sucks you know and they just yeah. have that like capability to more or less slow down and kind of figure it out and use their brains a little more. Right. So we talked about cat hunting. What does it look like to go bear hunting? You get up in the morning. What does that look like compared to cat hunting? So I would say bear hunting is a little more relaxed as far as like you don't have to drive super, super early in the morning to look for a track. You're kind of, you get up around daylight sometimes like if it's really hot, we'll get up a little bit before daylight. That way we're hitting roads right around daylight. Um, but if it's like going to be kind of a cooler day, like today, we'll probably go out this afternoon around five o'clock when it starts to get warm and sunny and the bears might start moving a little bit, but so kind of just whenever we feel like it, um, depending on like thermals and stuff too, we'll kind of change where we're going to go. If thermals are rising, we'll try to hit some higher ridge roads. If thermals are falling, we'll try to hit kind of Creek bottoms just to give the dogs the best advantage of kind of rigging bears that haven't necessarily crossed the road. Um, but we'll just go. We've got a couple of rigged dogs we'll throw up on top of the box so they have, like, a little more vantage to kind of smell, and then all the other dogs will be down in the box. They can still get their heads out, so they'll they'll rig if it's a good one. But then we'll just drive around and kind of wait and kind of gauge dogs. we got dogs that'll, like, that crash dog, he's real sensitive, so he'll bark a couple times and sometimes it's like okay I think he's just getting a little pocket of scent that he wants to run and then like you'll get the box rockers where it's like okay everybody's losing their minds that bear just crossed the road or it's right there and then you kind of go depending on how good the rig is we'll either just turn rig dogs down to kind of line it out because those are usually our older dogs or we'll just dump everybody out and let it be mass chaos yeah <laughs> with about 15 hounds <laughs> so basically you're uh you're he called them up there strike dogs, but mm -hmm. you're, you're, you've got a couple dogs up on top that you kind of trust that yep. when they, when they smell something, they'll start barking, yep. barking yep. and howling and, um, uh, baying or whatever. And, uh, th those are kind of the indications, right. That yep. indicate like there's something here. Yeah. So they'll, they'll tell us at that point, like we're not looking for a track. <laughs> they're looking for the track and they're kind of communicating to us that, Hey, there's a bear scent here. It's either, I'll be like, it's a really good bear scent. Let us off the box for right now. Or it's like, oh, well, there's a little bit of scent here, you know, like maybe it's something we could work, maybe not. And you kind of got to gauge depending on how excited they are and looking at their body language and how hard, how hard they're barking. Yeah. So that I found that amazing because when we were driving to Canada and again, the amount of bears up there, I mean, those dogs would strike sometimes three or four times per mile. Yeah. Uh, what you're, what's amazing is if, uh, some trail runner just decided up there, I'm going to go run 20 miles today and ran one of those roads. Mm -hmm. They had run those roads and 99% of the time, they're not going to see a bear. Yep. But if you took a dog on the same route, that dog might strike five, six, 10 times, yep. you know, but at least three or four times, five times, which means there's a, a bear scent fresh enough that those dogs strike on. Now, the other thing that's crazy to me is we'd be driving along at 40, 50 miles an hour mm -hmm. and those dogs would strike. Yep. Um, 
And you think about the sensitivity of a hound's nose Mm -hmm. to we as humans are sitting there. Our windows are open. We're smelling all the same thing and you smell absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, The sensitivity of their noses is is incredible. It is. With a dog and and same thing there, they would have dogs, a couple dogs you say strike kind of at at their own shadow, Mm -hmm. but they could also tell by the, especially that old dog with cancer, he would strike, he would let out a couple small, small barks and then be done. Mm -hmm. But then he'd let out like when, when he let out big ones and was really getting after it, I mean, jerking at the chain and like freaking out, Mm -hmm. like that was fresh. How old are those older scents that they're kind of barely striking on? Um, honestly, a lot of it just depends on like the conditions. Thermals and yeah. So sometimes, yeah, like if it's really wet, like, and if it's been, they'll, they love, love scent when it's wet because those bears just stink so much more. So we can run, we can get away with running a little bit older tracks. Um, when it's really hot and dry, it's like that bear scent has to be pretty fresh for them to smell it and get excited about it. Um, it, I mean, it just, it really just depends kind yeah. of on conditions for the day. And with bears, do you have, how often you've, have you had like your dogs get tangled up with the bears and get banged up? Um, you know, I haven't had much issue with it. I've had where a lot of my young dogs, they'll come back, they'll have like little nicks on their tail, on their hind end. Like they'll get kind of, they'll get smacked turning around and trying to get out of there after they got too close. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I haven't had anything bad. I had one, one young dog the first year that kind of got that bear came over the top of him and kind of grabbed him over the top of his spine but I think it was I had enough dogs there that they all piled in so she let him go right away so he had like a couple punctures and that was it but yeah I haven't personally had too much of an issue now they were talking up there that you'll get a lot of bears where they're they're bayed up they're not treed and so you know and same thing like you said you start looking at those collars and you might have to just put yourself on the trail like in the direction the bear's walking and basically yep. try to have that bear walk right into you yep you're trying to cut it off to where you're kind of either turning it back to where a better spot or you're trying to get it kind of like motivated to be like okay i gotta do something other than just walk or you're trying to get a shot at it it just kind of depends on what your goal is but have you had some sketchy situations with bears um you know i've walked in on a couple bayed bears that it's like get a little uncomfortable, but I haven't like had too much of an issue where it's like, oh man, like I've never been almost ran over by a bear. Personally, I've seen people almost ran over by bears before because sometimes like you'll try to get in front of it and cut it off just you and that bear will look right through you half the time. He, he doesn't care. He's trying to get away from the dogs. He's like, whatever, I'm going. Um, this guy up there, he's he's a couple times been flat ran over by bears. I yeah. think once or twice he's been bitten just a little bit or scratched up just a little bit. But yep. not that the bear is like really sitting there trying to eat him. It's just no. more he's trying to get away and yeah, you're, he's, you're he's, in the wrong way. He's you're moving away place. from the dogs and the dogs are the bigger threat than you are. So if he's got to go over the top of you, sometimes he will. Right, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's your favorite? Is it bear hunting or mountain lion hunting that's your favorite? Oh, that's a that's a trick question. I would say they're pretty apples to oranges as far as kind of the style of running. And I mean, it's to me, it's two like different sports almost. I don't know that I could pick a favorite. If, during springtime, my favorite is bear hunting. During winter, my favorite is cat hunting. So right now, I'd say my favorite is bear hunting because we're bear hunting right now. But I do love cat hunting too. So it just kind of, I I don't really have an answer for that one. Yeah. Uh. The thing that seems like every time I talk to your dad, like in the last couple of years, like, oh, Adeline treated a lion last night. Oh, she treated two today. And it's like, uh, how often are you going out? Almost every day. Really? Like during lion season, if the conditions are halfway decent, we're out. Um, if we've got any snow on the ground to go look for tracks. Just Sometimes. because you like it, not not to kill one or whatever, just because you like it. No, nope, I didn't even buy a tag this year. I had zero intention of harvesting a lion this year um i just am always trying to get the dogs out i'm always trying to get puppies more experience i'm always trying to get more training in and i just really really love being behind those dogs and seeing how much they love it and that's that's why why i do it i guess really yeah um it's uh what's what's the what's the worst like most miserable chase you've ever been on there's got to be a chase or two uh, where it's just been 
like absolute hell. Um, so and usually probably involves deep snow, steep mountains and downfall. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. So probably the worst hunt that I can think of that just sticks out in my mind was that first lion that I killed with my dad. But I mean, part of it too, I was like 13 or 14. So I was a little bit shorter, definitely out of shape. And that just seemed like it was the worst hike ever. Cause it was, it was a long ways. The snow was deep and we were having to hurry cause we only had so much time before daylight. And so that was just probably one of the most brutal. I had a bobcat height hunt that was pretty close to that, where it was like that snow that, you know, you kind of, you post hole. So you're right. kind of like, you almost stay on top and then you sink all the way down to your knees. And that one, I actually, I tried to call dogs back off of that one because it was like, okay, this is headed for a really bad area. This is not good. I can't move fast. The dogs are way, way ahead of me. And I got all my big dogs back, but I had one puppy that decided that he, I mean, he was, he's actually a really, really good dog now, but I couldn't get the collar tight enough on him. So he didn't know what tone meant yet. And normally like the puppies that are six, seven months, they'll turn around when all the big dogs turn around. And yeah. he was like, nope, going. I'm going. And he just kept going. And I mean, he finally treed that bobcat and I was. Which is good. I mean. It was, it was awesome. It turned into an awesome day, but man, it was like, oh my gosh, this is absolutely brutal. And I, I finally got there. I think I got to that bobcat tree like right at dark. So I ended up harvesting that bobcat because it was. By yourself? Yeah. It was it was a it was a nice bobcat, which is why I turned loose on it. And it was like okay, so this puppy just did something super awesome that you'd almost never see, and so I harvested it for him. And then I ended up leaving that bobcat up there and <laughs> with my pack, and I came out. And by the time I got back to the house, my dad was loading up snowmobiles to come look for me because he thought I was like stuck up on the mountain or something. But that was that was a tough one too. <laughs> really? Yeah. When was that? Uh that was. Two years ago. Because you killed a hell of a bobcat. Was it last year or was that the one two years ago? It you was, killed a monster It was bobcat. two years ago. That thing I think. Was, that was a big bobcat. Maybe it was last year. It was the same year. I honestly, I can't keep track anymore apparently. Yeah. I guess so it wasn't this last season, but the season before is what okay. it would have been. Uh, let's talk about wolves. Like what What do wolves mean to hound hunters? Um, Honestly, they take a lot of the fun out of it because you've always... The wolves just are so aggressive anymore. Like we've got this issue where we've got these packs of eight to 10 wolves, eight to 12 wolves. There's a pack um, in one of the areas that we run that's like almost 15 wolves. Like it's just crazy. And that pack is known for killing dogs. They kill dogs every season. They kill dogs in the bear season. They kill dogs in the cat season. And it's like, they're hard to keep track of. We kind of know where we think they like to den at. So during bear season, it's like we avoid that drainage altogether because usually they'll kind of stay in that general area during bear season. During cat season, they killed someone's dogs this year. Um, they had killed five out of 12 dogs um, during the first bear season. Um, but basically, wolves are just kind of one of those things that now, I mean, we they're part of the gig. We have to deal with it, but... They definitely make it to where they take some of the joy out of hound hunting because you're always just, you've always got that feeling in your gut that you're just like, I don't know if I'm going to see these dogs again alive, you know? Because, I mean, you could turn them loose and you get there and the wolves beat you there, but it's one of those things that during cat season, we do our best to control for it because we can kind of keep track of tracks and paying attention to where they're at. But during bear season, it's always a gamble unless you've ran in that area before because do, you just do you don't communicate know. with other hound hunters like, hey, we were up? you know, nine mile and there was mm -hmm. wolves here or yeah. do, do you, do you kind of do that back and forth or, or are you trying to hide your area? So then you're not, because no. I imagine most of you are driving similar roads. Yeah. I mean, I, I know most of the hound hunters that hunt in and around where we're at. So I, for the most part, we all know each other and we'll all kind of communicate and just kind of be like, hey, so this pack of seven was headed this direction. Just so you know, like if you're going to run that area, you just need to know, have a heads up. And I, we, we do communicate quite a lot. We do our best. And honestly, the only time that usually we don't know is if we don't have snow. So right. It's like, which is a lot. I mean, we have yeah. this year, it's been pretty rough because we've had a lot of that intermittent where we get some snow and then it all melts off and then we get snow and it all melts off. And that's made it a lot tougher to kind of keep track of wolves. Um, and those wolves are just killing those dogs because they're territorial. Yep. Yep. So they're during bear season, they're 
they'll have their den kind of in one drainage is at least kind of what we figured out and they'll just kind of hunt that drainage they'll sometimes I think they'll leave a little bit in the middle of the night but they don't like during the day they're going to be kind of close they'll kind of sit up on the ridge above their den so they're protecting their pups more or less um during cat season is kind of their breeding season so that's when they're more aggressive to where they're super territorial and if they hear hounds from half mile away sometimes they'll come in just to kill them because it's their territory yeah i mean it's been some years ago but i i don't remember who the houndsman was around here but somebody had basically all of his dogs wiped out on one one tree <clears throat> i don't remember this is probably 10 years ago but i mean that I remember was it being a big deal my dad i guess it was us we had dogs it might have been us we had dogs killed 12 years ago oh really it was me and my sister drew zyler and his brother trevor and we were out running a lion and we when we got to the tree we had three of the four dogs that we had there were killed by wolves they had been stretched really yeah so that was a pretty traumatic terrible experience once you once you have dogs killed you kind of don't really get over it i think it's like the hound hunting thing is never really quite the same because you've always got that kind of like anxious feeling at least for me and i think like so you guys have to carry those dogs out yep we carried them out it was actually in a it was pretty close to um where i had killed that first lion it was kind of in that same general area we came at it from a slightly different spot it was a little closer to one of our roads but we ended up coming all the way down through private and had to ask to use somebody's phone because it was just like it turned into kind of a disaster but we had three dogs that we were carrying out and then one dog that somehow i did she must have just turned and ran and got out of there quick enough but she came out with us and she was all right they hadn't even touched her so wow you know i found it really interesting when i was up there in canada canada i specifically asked him about the wolves up there because they have a shit ton of wolves mm -hmm. up there um none of the houndsmen ever have any issues whatsoever mm. uh with hounds and i was like man everybody down here has problems yep and we got to talking about it and what i kind i think i in in a way like maybe it's a little bit of a different um you know it could be the strain of wolves that we have down here compared to theirs or whatever but you know, I was telling him, you know, when we were driving roads up there looking for bears, we would drive a dirt road for for two hours, you know, three hours. I mean, it'd be like it'd be like hunting from here to Butte or Bozeman, literally. Yep. And then roads in every direction from there. Like it's so vast up there. The bush in Canada and Alaska, uh, it's so vast. It's just absolutely gigantic. I mean, literally the area we had to hunt was practically the size of Western Montana, yeah. you know, and we were starting to kind of surmise that maybe those wolves up there just aren't as territorial because of the amount of area yeah. that they have to operate in. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look like our, our country looks big to people and, and it's pretty big South of here, yeah. but when you look at the area like north of us up behind our high school here going over towards the reservation or up mm -hmm. nine mile going up that direction out west, um, even, you know, uh, some of the stuff east of here, you, know, you see this mountain range, but what you don't realize is there's like, there's a town right on the other side of it. Yeah. It's really not that big for an animal. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a lot for a human to hike, but mm -hmm. for a bear, for a wolf, mountain lion, whatever. Yeah. Um, so those wolves, if they're, say up behind our high school here, it's probably 20 miles of timber before you get down to the other side where there's, you know, you're getting into the valleys. Like yep. that's, that's an area that's really quite small. And if those wolves are trying to protect that from other wolves, from yep. bears, from mountain lions, and they're all competing for the same deer, the same elk, mm -hmm. the same moose. Mm -hmm. um, that's about all I can think as to why would it be so different? Cause he said like, they don't, He'll see wolf tracks or whatever. They don't. They'll they don't turn, worry about they'll it. They'll turn loose a mile later, like no big deal. Hmm. Um, um, do they hunt them hard over there? Wolves, you know, yeah. Uh, they hunt them, but I don't think you could hunt them hard because mm -hmm. the the size of the area yeah. is massive. Yeah. I mean, so I would say no, like not not that. I don't think they hunt them that hard, and I frankly think they have more wolves than we do. And now yeah. I don't know if they do per square mile mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Like if you if you take out of all of the valleys where the wolves aren't operating here and the towns and whatever, and you just put in the area that they really actually work in. Yeah. Um, I'll bet you our wolves per square mile are actually higher. Yeah, because they just have less. They just have less area where those wolves in Canada can run in any direction for a long damn ways. Yeah. And I think they have a lot of more game up there too. So they probably don't have quite the struggle of just finding food too. It's possible. Um, They definitely are getting more and more elk up there. Um, I know the wolves there for a long time had really hurt the moose, but the moose were kind of coming back up there and they had taken some packs out. Mm -hmm. Um, It's hard to say, but that's, that's the other thing. I just don't think people realize like, uh, if you just spot and stock bears or you spot and stock mountain lions, mm-hmm. uh, our ability to somewhat control the population of predators uh, would be highly ineffective. I mean, really, bear hunting's been that way up until, when was it, three years ago that they yep, let, so let this hound? is our third bear season with hounds. With hounds, yep. yeah. Um, we have a lot of bears, but but the mountain lion population... Uh, would be vastly different without hound hunters. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's so hard to hunt lions without hounds. Just pure it's, luck. Yeah, because, I mean, especially in this kind of country, it's not like you can sit and glass them up. I mean, occasionally you'll have someone that's like, oh, my gosh, I saw a mountain lion today. It was, like, the craziest thing ever, you know, once-in-a-lifetime thing. Yeah. You just you don't see them. They're so All invasive. the time I've spent in the woods, I've seen mountain lions, think, twice. Yep. And both times they were running, like, like it was a flash of a mountain lion. Yeah, it was like, gone. oh, there's a tail, like, yeah, you don't have, you never had an opportunity for a shot. Right. So. Um, I know some guys have tried to go cut a track and then just hike it down, yep. um, which is possible. Mm-hmm. It's possible if you're, if you're good and it's a fresh track. Yep. Um, it's a lot of patience. Yeah. A lot of hiking. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, for people that, that maybe are, are unfamiliar with hound hunting or, or maybe their first reaction is like, well, oh, it's mean to the animals or whatever. There's that other side of it of where you guys are also kind of doing somewhat of a service. Uh, you know, the, the the lions or the bears that you do take, the amount of fawns, you yep. know, and does and whatnot that, and, you know, that those animals are taken down every year is staggering. And I don't know how many deer a, a year a mountain lion eats. Uh, Henry, can you Google? I'd be curious to see what they say. Yeah, like a, like a deer or a bear, how many fawns or, or elk calves a year? Yeah, I mean, lions will do, like, supposedly about one kill a week. If yeah. it's, like, a female with kittens, she's going to have to kill yeah, a, a few more, more than that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of like an average that we've kind of seen and I've heard of. But it's, yeah. I, yeah I'm deer. sure every cat's different, you know. <laughs> yeah, if you think about a deer a week and if there's 40 cats in a certain area yep. at 52, you know, it's a, it's a couple of, hundred uh it adds up pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, and the other thing that I think people don't always necessarily think about that I was actually kind of listening to a podcast the other day. So there's this guy named Bart George that was doing a study over in Washington with hounds. And they were kind of seeing um, basically the interaction that like the lions had with people before being ran with hounds and then after being ran and kind of harassed by the hounds. And he was basically just, they'd collar these lions and then he would take a speaker and play that speaker and walk on, walk straight towards this cat. And they just measured the data on how close that cat let him get before taking off. And then how far that cat would run after it decided to take off. And they did this a couple of times. And then after that, they'd go catch it with the hounds and they kind of like, I, I don't know if they were, like shooting them with paintball guns or what they were doing, but they were just basically harassing that cat and making it uncomfortable in the tree. And I think I'm not entirely sure what they found in the study, but I know that it was like, I don't know if they've even completed the study yet, but from what they were seeing after being harassed by those hounds, they didn't want, like they wouldn't let people get super close. Like they'd start to hear, hear human voices and they'd move further away. Right. So hikers and kids outside and even, even just being around homes and, Yeah, so you're about right. Right, yeah, well, and it depends on uh, what angle the article's yeah. wanting to go at. But, 
I mean, it kind of it kind of tends to make sense that mm-hmm. you know about a deer a week or so, and that and that's if if a kill gets taken from them, um, yep. they may have to kill another one. If that's... if they're able to sit on one big deer, mm-hmm. that might last them a couple weeks potentially. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's been a big thing that we've seen too is those wolves. I mean, you'll cut a lion track, and there will be three, four wolf tracks over the top of it. Those wolves are just following those lions to steal their kills. Like oh, they've, really? They figured it out. I mean, it's it's a big big problem that they've kind of. I think they've, I don't know if they're studying it yet or not, or if they're, they're kind of looking into it, but it's like those, those wolves really like to steal lion's kills because the lions, I mean, they can't fight against three, four wolves, five, six wolves, you know, no, they're going to, they don't stand a chance. So they'll just kill something and the wolves show up and they're like, well, I got to go kill something else. So then you got some of the people that really hate, hate lions are like, oh, well, those lions are killing so many deer. And it's like, well, part of the reason too is that. Yeah, those wolves are pushing them off kills, so they're having to kill more than they normally would. Not to mention the amount of deer that those wolves are killing all by themselves. Yep, deer, elk, moose, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Bears. I mean, I've heard stories where they'll they'll drag bears out of their dens in the middle of winter and eat them. Like they're just destructive on everything. Interesting. Well, that'd be such an easy kill too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if they can find them, they will. I mean, it's. They're they're smart and they they just want to kill. If they can kill and it's easy, they're going to do it. Right. What uh, when you left high school, you went to school for a little while. You were a, and you were a thrower, right? Yep. So I went to MSU Bozeman, um, and I threw hammer and shot put. How long did you do that for? Um, I went all the way through, so I did four years. Four years. Four full years. Yeah. Did you enjoy that? It was fun. I I really enjoyed my time. Like I enjoyed my teammates. I really enjoyed our um, lifting program, and I felt like it kept me in a better headspace as far as just like being able to get through school and stuff. Is because I basically had something that I was always doing and kind of keeping me accountable and that kind of thing. Um, it was a very beneficial time. I made a lot of friends that I have now that I still have that I keep in contact with and. What did you study? Um, I double majored in psychology and exercise science. So oh, wow. I was planning on maybe going to law school or PT school, and now I'm doing neither. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so how and hunting took over. Yep, or yep. Running hounds. Now I'm going to go be an outfitter. Yeah. So let's talk <laughs> about that. You, uh, you, uh, you just bought an outfit with your boyfriend. Is that right? Yep. So Aaron actually is buying the outfit with. He's got an investor that's going to help us more or less pay for it and we'll basically taking out a loan but through a friend rather than through some sort of bank it's really hard to get loans on on outfits outfits. (laughs) yeah Yeah. especially because this one doesn't come with actually any like private property or anything so it's basically like a blue sky permit public land permits yep Yep. so like we'll have some campsites and stuff that we can utilize and we have a couple cabins um and a different campsite that we can old forest service cabins that we have access to that we'll be able to use a lot of it'll be out of wall tents and stuff, but we're we're excited for it. It's going to be an yep. adventure. Where's this outfit? It's down in Idaho along the Locksaw River. So. Okay. Yeah, country, it's pretty flat there. It's not very steep. There's no trees or mountains. Um, no, it's super easy. It's very easy country. I'm excited <laughs> to go hike until I die. Yeah. But. I, uh, I, I uh, hunted in the Selway a little bit, and mm-hmm. that, that country over there in Idaho is just straight up straight down yep um it's not exactly where i'd want to turn a dog loose and have to go follow it up and up and down the mountains yeah. but it's riddled with uh bears and mm-hmm. mountain lions and um yeah, they got a that, lot that of is the country i was saying like as far as being uh, like bigger country mm-hmm. south of my house basically i mean yep. other than lolo uh that lolo pass road highway 12 uh when you look out my back deck there's really nothing between me and boise yeah. I mean, that's a massive uh, that's, yeah, amount crazy. of country back there, you know, mm-hmm. west of Hamilton, Montana, and yep. west of, you know, low, low Montana, and then all the way over into Idaho and, and, and down practically all the way to Boise. Yep. Between the Frank Church Wilderness, the Selway, you know, Bitterroot National Forest. Like, it's a, that's a massive piece of ground, and mm-hmm. so it's definitely a good area for predators to thrive. Yeah, there's, I mean, from everybody that we've talked to, and I've talked to quite a different, few different guys, different houndsmen that have ran down there, all the outfitters that are kind of down and around that area and stuff. And there's, they're, they're like, well, there's one thing that there is no shortage of, and that is bears. So 
yeah. we're going to be primarily doing bear hunts. We'll do a lot of baited bear hunts and then we're offering hound hunts too, obviously with the hounds. So, yeah. So baited bear hunts, uh, are not legal here in Montana, but they are legal in Idaho, Idaho. And that's really there again, the baited thing, uh, you know, gets questioned a lot yeah. and I, I've never done a baited bear hunt. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I do prefer spot and stock just the sport of, you know, trying to figure it out yeah. and it's, it's a challenge and mm -hmm. you're prob probably going to fail. Um, yep. uh, the hounds with bears is also very physically difficult yep. and, um, you know, that there's, there's challenges with that, but the baited bears, the one thing I will say is it really does give you the time to select exactly the right bear. If you, yep. if you're trying to take an older bear, a mature bear, a male, yep. uh, look for cubs. Like, uh, I know people make mistakes that are really good hunters, um, that, that watch a bear for a long time and they, yep. they shoot it. And then, you know, as they're coming up to it or once they shoot it, then they all of a sudden find like there's cubs. Yeah. Um, and, and for people tough. that don't know all this stuff, like, you know, you're not allowed to shoot a, uh, you know, a sow bear with, with cubs. I mean, for obvious reasons, but, um, those mistakes happen every year. But if you're watching a bear from three or 500 yards away, half a mile away, um, and you get in and take a long shot, uh, you may not know those cubs are just napping over in the, on the side. It yep. really can be hard to, to tell, yep. to judge. That's where hound hunting and, and baiting can kind of help mitigate in. some of that. Yeah. Do you see uh, sows with cubs go up a tree pretty quickly when like with the hounds to keep your hounds from hurting cubs or whatever? Yep. So typically what I've seen is that sow will send her cubs up first. Sometimes she'll kind of sit at the base of the tree and swat at dogs a little bit, but usually she'll follow them up and go straight into the same tree. And so your hounds are never really hurting cubs. I've never ever had an issue with it. Yeah. She's sending them up early. Yeah. They're, they're usually pretty smart. I mean, they, those bears teach those cubs you hear anything even remotely scary and you're going up a tree because that's kind of their main defense mechanism when they're little like that. Right. So with this outfit, um, you're you're going to be doing mountain lion hunts. Are you going to be doing elk, deer, any of that? Or is it yep, uh, so pretty much all predators? We'll do a ton of spring bear hunts here. And then come September, we're going to be doing some archery elk hunts and also more fall bear hunts so we can still run dogs september all the way through october 10th so we'll do more bear hunts there with the towns and then we'll do a couple rifle elk hunts during october and i think the season ends november 3rd but then after that we actually have the ability to cat hunt coming from november 3rd and on so we'll be We'll be doing some elk hunts, some deer hunts. I guess we've, we've got a couple mule deer hunts that we're going to do. I think one of my um, friends up in Canada is going to come down to kind of do one of the mule deer hunts because she's never killed a mule deer. And we're like, well, we don't really know what mule deer are in the country. So we figured this way we kind of get the chance to kind of experiment and see what's going on before we try to sell any of those hunts. But Sure. What uh, are you going to have other guides working for you? Or? Yep. So we've got currently one other guide guide that's going to be a full-time guide for us with us um and then we've got a camp cook coming up from texas so we're really excited to meet him he's he actually outfits down in texas too so he just has a slightly different timeline so he was like i just want to kind of get to come up and experience this kind of country and i'll come cook for you so that's going to be fun but um yeah that's so the we'll one have, that's man that's the one piece of advice i'll tell you what uh you can't control the bears and the mountain lions and the weather and blah, 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 but you can definitely control camp, Thinking, Yep. you know, and the food. And yep. there's a lot of people that will, you know, that have gone home from camps empty handed mm -hmm. that will rebook and rebook and rebook just because of the experience, yep. the, pe the people, the guides, mm -hmm. um, and the food. Yep. And there's been a lot of people that have gone somewhere and shot something and said, I'll never go back because the yep. camp wasn't that enjoyable. Yep. Yep. It's just atmosphere. And I mean, if everybody's having a good time, then it makes it a lot easier. So, and that's part of the reason I'm so excited to guide with dogs because I think, I mean, it's hard not to be happy and having fun when you're out and you've got all these happy, goofy hound dogs that are just like loving life. And it's like, yeah, we might go catch three small bears and you decide you don't want to shoot one, but you know, you got that experience and it was an exciting experience. A lot of times, I mean, 
it gets kind of wild and we'll be driving around like crazy and people are just like, oh my gosh, this is insane. Like what an adrenaline rush. And it's definitely a different lifestyle than most states. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. So it's just, it's just one of those things that it's like, I think just having that experience, I'm trying to, I'm actually doing a woman's hunt. Our first, it'll be our first official week of guided hunts. I'll have a couple women out that are going to come kind of do the hound hunting thing. And I'm really excited for that because I know like I've done some of the women's retreats and stuff. I helped Tana with um, two of them in Alaska. And yeah, that was talk cool. a little bit about that. The Grendas, right? Yep. Um, yep. Talk about what you did up there. So basically she just runs like these women's retreats where we go up and we have a day of just like shooting. So everybody gets to kind of learn how to shoot rifles, handguns, bows I mean basically whatever they want to do um and then we go out and we go out on float planes and they'll drop us off on a lake in the middle of the bush middle of nowhere just a bunch of women like 10 women and we go out and we set up all these tents that we've got and we'll go hike around um we'll do like Lindsay Persico taught some wilderness survival stuff so she's teaching how to build fires how to do all this first aid stuff which is super important um and then yeah we kind of just hung out and had fun and had an experience of getting to see all this wildlife i mean alaska's wildlife is pretty unique compared to yeah anything down here i mean we saw big old brown bears we saw wolverine on one of the days which was kind of nuts um bunch of caribou moose yeah. fox we had a den of foxes right up behind one of the camps that was little baby foxes running around they were super cute super curious they'd come right over to us um we did some fishing stuff like that um it was a super unique experience and i think that all of the women that went there and got to be a part of that really enjoyed it and yeah would definitely recommend it yeah that's really cool yeah it's uh it's cool watching following their page what's their instagram uh, is it like, um, so Tana's is Tana, Tana Sue Sue fit. fit or something. Yep. So she does like fitness coaching as well. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then Adams is just Grenda something. I don't yeah. remember it off the top of people my People can mind. search like Adam Grenda or. Yeah. Should be able to find him pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. They're cool people. Mm -hmm. Um, and cute little girls and pretty oh, bad, yeah. a, pretty badass kids as well. Yep. Um, I, I yep. like parenting like that. You know, the way your dad raised you and your mom. Yep. Um, the way they're raising their kids, um, I, I, kids are more capable than oh, most absolutely. people give them credit for. I'm, I'm so fortunate for how I was raised because I mean, I'm able to go out here and do all this stuff that I think as a society thing, I mean, there's, there's a lot of women anymore that do hunt, but there's a lot of women that don't hunt and don't even think about it. And there's women that feel like, you know, if I can go hunt if I have a man to, you know, take me out or right. if my, if my boyfriend will go hunting with me or show me how to hunt or my dad will show me how to hunt, then I can go hunting. But a lot of women don't necessarily feel comfortable going out by themselves. And I think that if you're kind of raised in the way that it's like, Oh yeah, you're fine. Like it's perfectly normal to go hunt by yourself. The woods is not any more dangerous than anywhere else. I've honestly, I feel safer in the woods. I'd rather go run into a grizzly bear in the woods than I would a person, you know? Right. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. You come walking down a trail and there's a, a random dude walking down a trail and you're a yeah. female, it's, you're definitely going to be a little more uneasy in that situation, knowing there's no witnesses, there's nobody around. Yeah, I mean, um, I've, I've personally never been worried about it, but usually I have a couple guns on me. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, guns and dogs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're coming pretty well equipped. Um, what's... You got any like crazy stories from your, from some of your hunts or some of the stuff you've done with your hounds or, um, I've seen, I've seen pictures on you guys' Instagram freaking Jeep rolled over and un, up, upside down. And cause that's the other part of like getting around, uh, Houndsmen are hard on all of our equipment. I mean, vehicles, clothes, all of that. I mean, we are just brutal on equipment. I mean, I think my Jeep, I redo the entire front end almost every year because of just how much like you're driving through the snow you're romping it you're airing down tires trying to get on top and it's just like it just absolutely chews up that front end and what are you airing your tires down to like psi um honestly during cat season i'll run them around 15 really and then if it gets like really bad i'll air them down to all the way like to five pounds five pounds yeah so do you have air on board to air them back up 
Um, I've got a little tiny air compressor that I can just plug into my cigarette lighter. It's it's slower than onboard air, but it was like Cheaper. forty bucks. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> forty bucks versus like two hundred bucks to get the whole thing set up and all that. So yeah, it works. Have you found that your Jeep gets around incredibly well in the snow? Yeah, so I've got a Jeep, and then I've also got a Chevy Silverado, and man, I that Chevy Silverado compared to that Jeep just is terrible. Like I won't, I don't is it even like the driving tires are it. Narrow? Um, yeah, so you've got a narrower like wheelbase, so it'll track better, and it's just way lighter. Yeah. So it can climb up on top of some of that. Like if it, the snow's a little bit hard, it'll kind of climb up on top, and then you're not falling all the way through. Are you chaining your Jeep up too? I've chained it up. Well, shoot, once we chained it up this year when Tannic actually came up for a cat hunt and we were over on some of the south side here and we were coming down a road and, man, it was like we had turned the dogs had kind of finally, it was a long, long day. We had dogs running like a dry ground track because we had little tiny patches of snow. And, I mean, finally, like, we turned out puppies and the puppies were the ones that managed to figure it out. And so Aaron bailed over the hill to go to the dogs because they were treated in just an absolute nasty hole. And we went around to try to get closer and we went up this road and man, it was pure, pure ice, ice. Yeah. ice and like the narrowest road you can find. And it had a little bit of a slant, of course, off of the mountainside. And it was like, she got out, <laughs> walked behind me. She's like, this is terrible. Like, what I wonder are if we that's doing? the same place I got in a little bit of a bind up like Corral Creek. Uh, yep. Yep. So going it up was, over to like Albert Point and Albert Creek and Albert yep. Creek or whatever they call it. So there's that road that comes off of Albert that kind of just goes off around and wraps towards Corral Creek and then dead ends. That's yeah. the one we were on. But all of those roads get so icy. If they do because like they have some south side exposure. They get yep. some sun. They melt, but it's for a very short amount of time. Then they freeze. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. The snow's one thing, but the ice. I mean, oh yeah, that's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, that that gets a little sketchy. For sure, um, yeah. And you guys probably do a lot of winching and shit like that. Yep. I, you know, I use my winch, I think, once this year. We just didn't get the snow like we used to or like we normally do. Right. So I I think I got my Jeep stuck once this year, and that's, I Are mean, you using a steel winch or rope? Um, I've got the steel. Yeah. Um, I actually need to replace my winch because it was showing me that it was about on its last leg the last time I used it. But we just haven't had snow this year, so it hasn't been like, oh, yeah, I mean... I've used it for ice once or twice, but for the most part, it's just when I bury myself in snow and don't feel like shoveling for a couple hours. Right, exactly. So. Yeah. Do you do a lot of snowshoeing? You know, I've never strapped on a pair of snowshoes. There's been multiple occasions. Those post holing days would yes. be, you could be cruising. Yes, and I've been like, man, why didn't I grab my snowshoes? And then usually it's like I think about it just a little too late and the thing is it's like you're always trying to get to dogs as fast as you can so it's like oh man am I going to take the time to stop and put on snowshoes when in reality it probably would help and I probably would be there faster if I took the time to but in my mind it's like well if I have to go into all this like thick stuff the snowshoes are going to hinder me and I'm going to have to take them back off and you just don't know so I mean I know a lot of people that do use snowshoes and there's been times where I wish I had them but yeah. I haven't so yeah yeah no doubt the uh I was telling a guy the the problem is you can't really haul gear and stuff, but the snow bikes, mm -hmm. uh, those snow bikes are incredible where you can go. You yeah. just can't haul. You can't pull a sled or, you know, yeah. do much on them. But as far as just getting to the site quickly, mm -hmm. be really um, nice. man, those things are incredible where they can go in the timber yeah. compared to a snowmobile. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're limited on what you can do with them really, but. Yeah, I've, I've looked at them. They cost a lot of money, so it's like, well. Yeah, they're expensive. I got I got a snowmobile, and that's kind of what I use when the snow gets deep, and those are nice for as far as access goes. But like you said, they don't. You can't just go straight up the side of the mountain unless you're really talented, and I'm not really talented on a snowmobile, so. Yeah. What, uh, well, and when you're guiding, you, you, you're you going to have to assume that your people that you're taking are, you know, have yeah. never even been on yep. one. Yep, Uh with the guiding and with the outfitting, what's the name of your outfit? Um, so we are going to be under Whiskey Mountain for a couple weeks here because we still haven't got the full transfer, so it's not technically under our name yet. So we're working for the other outfitter, but it's going to be Granite Peak Outfitters okay. once we actually get everything fully transferred over. So it's kind of, we're in that in-between phase right now, but yeah, yeah it'll be. it got to be pretty exciting and nerve wracking, huh? Buying an outfit. Yep. I'm really excited. Definitely, definitely nervous. Cause you know, it's just one of those things that it's new and we don't entirely know what to expect. I mean, we know we'll have fun, but yeah, 
Well, I mean, it's what you're doing every day anyway, so you yeah. might as well try to get... And exactly. How, you you got to figure out a way to make this thing pay a little or you're going to have to go get a day job. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The hounds have to pay for themselves. So. Your dad's been telling me for a couple of years. <laughs> she needs to find herself a damn job, but I she know. has <laughs> cat hunts too much. I know. It's it's terrible. It's an addiction. And I've been really fortunate for how patient my parents have been with me because, I mean, they should have kicked me out probably a long time ago. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm finally getting to the point where we're going to be moving out and the hounds are going to be paying for themselves. And I mean, I've always been able to sell a couple dogs and kind of be able to stay to where I'm not totally like right owing money by any means, but I definitely haven't been to where I'm making good enough money to be able to go out and buy sure. a house and have a place to actually keep all of my houses. Yeah. So. Well, starting a business, I don't care what you're starting. I mean, you know, I, I had a day job when I started mine and it was in the garage and yep. you know, most people don't just have the money to go stroke checks and just, oh, yeah. you know, go off and do it all. I mean, it's a building process for sure. Yep. Uh, if people are interested in uh, what, like what's a, what's a, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to be like, what's a bear or a mountain lion hunt going to cost for somebody to come up and do a, do a hunt. So our bear hunts are 3,500 for a baited bear hunt. And then kind of what we ask is like 4,200 for a hound hunt, just because gas money and dog food and all that stuff obviously costs more. Yeah. Um, but we actually do offer like group discounts and stuff. So we mm -hmm. make it more affordable if you're coming with multiple people. Do you guys have a website yet people can book through or? Not quite. So all of our booking, like I said, we're still going through Whiskey Mountain because we still don't technically own the outfit. We're waiting on Forest Service to finish all the permitting. Okay. Um, more or less, they just reach out to either... Well, they can follow you, right, on Instagram. Would that be the best way for them to, like, DM you? Yep, they can just DM me on there, and then I can kind of go through Anthony still. And right. that's, like, all of our elk hunts will, We're running everything. It's just that we still have to be under an outfitter until we have the technical license. So Right, right. What's your Instagram? Um, Half-ass houndswoman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one's a long story, too. But What's um, that story? Oh, someone was kind of making fun of me and my hounds so i kind of just rolled with it as a joke but. yeah call, <laughs> called you a half-ass hounds woman and uh, i called my hounds a half-ass pack of hounds and i was like oh okay i kind of like that actually we'll roll with it <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome uh, but that's that funny was... so half-ass hounds woman um yep. get a hold of you there uh, if you guys are interested in hunts uh western montana um I guess the good thing with the uh, baited bear thing, if you're not in crazy good shape, that's a little easier uh, physically. Yep. If you want to do the uh, the cats or the bears, you you better be able to at least get your ass up and down a mountain a little bit. Yeah, and I mean we're we're pretty capable of like if we're running hounds, there will be two of us. So one of us will run to the hounds, and then if we've got a client, they can take their time and make it there when they make it there there's no big rush but right and we can kind of do we're gonna do a lot of combos too where it's like okay we went out with the hounds and i'm exhausted and don't think i can go for another hike tomorrow we'll go set you on a bait and kind of yeah. do that um the yeah. lion hunts are like you were asking price i think we're doing a five-day hunt for six thousand and then a seven-day hunt for eight thousand so mm -hmm. those are a little more expensive but the lion hunts are just kind of a primo hunt right Sure. there's so much that goes into them and so much that goes into dogs and training dogs and keeping dogs and all that. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing people don't realize too. I mean, what's it, what's it cost to buy a, 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 a well-bred pup? Um, so puppies like completely untrained are going to be anywhere from 500 to 1500 bucks. It depends on the breeder. It depends on that. Um, I actually, so my dad's been kind of breeding hounds for a while and he's pulled a lot of good blood from other people. And so I've just been breeding kind of what he gave to me more yeah. or less. So I don't, I have well, a lot of But pup. the point is though, is there's, there's a lot of money in, in whether you are training them and raising them the spent, yep. the time spent. It was actually interesting. You mentioned earlier that during lion season, those dogs are actually resting a lot more because mm -hmm. the rest of the year you're actually running those dogs and training them and probably putting a lot more miles on them than you really yep. are maybe during season. Yeah, during cat season, I would say they don't get a ton of miles. Our average lion race is anywhere from a mile to, like, three miles is a pretty long race. Those cats just don't – I mean, they'll travel, but they're not, like, gone, gone, you know. Occasionally, you'll get a tom or a female. Like, a female will go up, and she'll have dropped her kitten somewhere, and she'll have made a kill. So, she'll make a great big loop where she picks up her kittens and brings them back to that kill. Oh, interesting. Um, 
but like the toms sometimes those toms will be moving areas and those those races can get long but also like compared to like a bear race so those dogs are moving slow they're picking they're barking every now and then they're not exerting a ton of energy on those races um a bear race almost as soon as we let them go their heads are in the air and they are barking nonstop and running as hard as they can yeah and those races are, I mean, sometimes you get lucky and they're 500 yards. Sometimes they're 10 miles. Like I had one bear that we ran for 11 hours. <laughs> it was like the most ridiculous. And I mean, I was, I had one dog that stuck that race the entire time. Really? The rest of the time I was picking up dogs, throwing them in the box, throwing more dogs out, kind of just resting and like basically relay racing it because that bear just kept going. That's amazing. And those dogs were, I mean, they were getting wiped out. They were tired. And it was like, okay, throw them in, get them some water really quick. Once we get back around that bear crosses the road again, we'll throw them back out. And that was, that was a big bear. He, really? he bait up quite a few times. And then every time we'd get close, he'd blow out of there. And I was just like, oh my gosh. And that was some nasty, nasty country. That was up six mile. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Most of the country around this area is pretty steep. Yeah. But Well, thanks for popping in here and talking about hound hunting and yeah <laughs> running bears and cats so anything else you want to chat about or you got um not not really uh, i don't think but. okay <laughs> well follow half-assed hounds woman and uh get yourself a bear hunt or a cat hunt come to montana spend some time right in uh right in our backyard here so it's kind of cool and uh congrats on the on the outfit thank you we're, Con- we're congrats excited. on uh <laughs> turning this into a job (laughs) yeah right hunting into a job that's everybody's dream exactly (laughs) for the most part all right thanks